Welcome to Using Functional Programming in Python. My name is Christopher, and I will be your guide. This course is all about functional programming. That's an approach to coding that primarily focuses on the combinations of functions. Python sports functional programming since its functions are objects, meaning they can be passed as references, returned from other functions, and have values assigned to them. This can seem a little odd if you're more accustomed to the procedural programming world, and there are other languages that focus solely on this approach, but Python supports it, and for certain classes of problems, it can be the right way to go about doing things. There are three functions that come with Python that are commonly used with a functional programming approach. They are map, which applies a function to each item in an iterable, filter, which creates a subset of an iterable based on filtering criteria, and reduce, which combines the items in an iterable through composition, for example, accumulating a sum. This course introduces you to the functional programming approach and concentrates on these three functions in the Python language. The code in this course was tested using Python 3.14, but that really doesn't matter. The concepts here have been around in Python for a very long time. The reduce function got moved from being a built-in to the functools module in Python 3, but as long as you know where to find it, you can do almost everything that I'm going to show you here with older versions of the interpreter. Functional programming is a coding approach based on composing functions together to achieve your results. Some languages work exclusively this way, and others, like Python, allow it if you feel like it. Python supports a functional programming approach because functions themselves are objects, which means you can assign values to them. Note, I mean actually assigning properties to the function itself, not just defining a variable within them. It also means you can pass a function as a reference, treating it like data, not just invoking it. And ultimately, that same concept extends to the fact that you can return a function reference from another function or method. Python's built-in library includes the map and filter functions, and the functools module contains a lot of other tools that support a functional programming approach. In the next lesson, I'll kick things off by explaining the different programming approaches and just what it means to be functional. In the previous lesson, I gave an overview of the course. This lesson introduces you to the idea of functional programming. Broadly speaking, there are three big categories of programming approaches. The first, and probably earliest of them, is procedural. That's when you have a series of statements which execute in order. The term procedural comes from the fact that many of the early languages that worked this way had a mechanism for grouping code together called a procedure. Technically speaking, there's a distinction between a procedure and a function, but in practice a lot of folks use the terms interchangeably. So although procedures and functions are the same thing, functional programming is actually something subtly different. I'll get to that in a second. Language creators started to notice that it was sometimes helpful to associate chunks of code with data. This kind of grouping can be done ad hoc, like keeping the associated stuff in the same file, or it can be part of a language feature. One such language feature is object-oriented programming, where you declare a class, which is a logical grouping of code and data. If I have a person class, it could have a name value to store their data, and a method that performs an action with that data, like printing out a message to that person. Python tends to use the term method to differentiate functions from functions associated with a class, but again, in the field, you may hear these terms used loosely. The third approach is known as functional programming. This emphasizes functions and composing them together. The most common requirement that determines if a language can use a functional approach is whether you can reference a function without invoking it, for example, passing it into another function, and then referencing it and possibly invoking it inside of that containing function. I am very intentionally being vague about all of this, as most of the terms have extremely specific meanings, and sometimes a specific meaning in one language is subtly different from a specific meaning in another. Some languages can only use one of these three approaches, while others mix and match. Python supports all three, which some purists might argue means it doesn't really embrace any of them properly. Rather than put on my flame return underwear in expectation of a lively conversation in the comment thread, I'll just ask that if you're about to, but what about, or yes, but technically, then I concede the argument and you're probably correct. 
My intent here isn't to get into a hair splitting contest, but to give you a high level sense of the kinds of approaches so you can contrast functional programming from the rest. Classification of programming languages and features is kind of like biology. There's always a platypus out there to muck up your groupings. To be considered a functional style programming language, you typically need two features. The first is functions can be treated as data, meaning you can reference them without invoking them, and ultimately pass them around as arguments to other functions. And second, function references can be returned from a function, which of course if they meet the whole data criteria I just mentioned really just means being able to return that same data. Python treats functions as first class citizens, which honestly isn't special to functions. Everything in Python is an object, even functions. So when you think of how strings have data and methods, like upper, that's because they're objects and functions themselves can do the same thing. A lot of Python programming is thought of as procedural as you aren't explicitly using the object-oriented features. But since everything is an object, you could argue that even the procedural stuff is object-oriented. And well, functional programming is possible in Python because of how it implemented its object-oriented approach. Yes, Python's reptilian name notwithstanding, it kind of is the platypus of programming languages. Oh, and before you head down to the comments, yes, I know it isn't named after the snake. Requisite comedy sketch troop references are inbound shortly. Okay, that's the rough what. Let's attack the why as well. To make that whole classification thing messier, there's also something called a pure functional programming language. That's one where the functions have no side effects. There's a debate of the definition of no in that sentence, but I'm already tiptoeing through the landmines at this point. A side effect is when the function causes something outside of the function to change. If your function contains state or is making a change to something besides the data passed in, then it isn't considered pure. Now, why is that a big deal? Well, if you can keep your functions pure, it has a few advantages. First off, you can compose functions together and not worry about how they'll behave. If none of them have side effects, you only have to worry about the data you're passing around. This self containment means behavior of the code is more transparent, and a big advantage is it tends to be very parallelizable. When you're dealing with massive amounts of data and need to do large amounts of computation, a functional approach lends itself to splitting the problem up into parts and running them on different machines. Some programming languages enforce this pureness. Python does not, but it does have the tools to write using a functional approach. It just leaves it up to you as to whether to create side effect free code or not. Okay, that's enough background. In the next lesson, I'll show you how functions in Python are objects and how that enables a functional programming approach. In the previous lesson, I explained the three high level programming approaches. In this lesson, I'll show you how functions are objects in Python. Let's dive right into the REPL and play around. Let's start out by creating a simple function. And now let me call it. Well, hello there to you too. Hopefully this wasn't a surprise. Stop and consider for a moment just what those parentheses on the end of say hello are for. That's what tells Python to invoke the function of that name. But what happens if you leave them off? Functions in Python are objects. Without the parentheses, the REPL evaluates it, telling you what it is. In this case, it tells you that it's a function that has the name say hello, and then there's an object address reference. That number is a unique value within the interpreter having to do with where it's stored. You can more or less ignore it, although sometimes when you're using the interpreter, it can be handy to see if two things that have the same content are actually a reference to the same thing in memory. Since say hello is an object, I can create a new reference to it. This is no different than something like x equals 1, then y equals x. I've created a new reference pointing to the same object, and since it points to the same thing, I can use parentheses on it to invoke the corresponding code. This goes for more than just the functions you define. Print is a built-in function. When you examine a reference to it, you get similar output to above. Because it ships with Python, the information's a little different, but it is the same idea. Back in the intro, I said you could write most of the code I'm showing you even in very old versions of Python. 
This would be the exception, as print used to be a statement but became a built-in function in Python 3. The print function takes arguments. Here I've passed it a single argument, which is a string, which print then outputs to the screen. It's kind of print's purpose. Print can also take multiple arguments, and they don't have to be strings. If they're not, it converts them to text for printing. If you give it multiple arguments, it outputs each of them separated by a space. There are ways of changing that, but that's not important here. Since functions are objects, I can pass a reference to the say hello function into print as an argument. Remember, I'm not invoking it here. I'm treating it like data. The result is print outputs the same thing that the REPL evaluation showed just a few lines ago, which of course means Yep, you can print a uh, reference to print. Python's dir function returns a list of all the properties of an object. There's a lot of stuff in here, and that's because every object in Python inherits from a default object that includes a bunch of special methods and properties. Python notes that they're special by using leading and trailing double underscores. These are known as dunder methods. This might feel like a bit of a tangent, but give me a second. Since a function is an object, like with any other object, I can dynamically add a new property to it. Here I've created a property called language, and inside of it I'm storing the string en. Like with any other property, I can evaluate it in the REPL. If I call dir on this again, you can see that language has been added to the list of things associated with the function object. Okay, it's time to define a couple more functions. First, something similar to say hello. Now, something a little different. Not that it's completely different, just a little different. Obscure Monty Python reference for the win. The outside function takes an argument. That's something I hope you've seen before. The little difference part is that on the second line of outside, the argument gets invoked with parentheses. The expectation here is that the argument passed into outside is a function reference. If it isn't, invoking it will cause an exception. Let's call outside, passing it inside. Remember, the argument to outside is a reference to the inside function. The second line of outside invokes inside, resulting in the second line of output. I know I'm being repetitive and bashing this kind of hard, but to show the difference, let's try using parentheses on inside. Before I do it, let me pause here for a second. Take a moment to predict what will happen. Will you see output? If so, what will it be? Will there be an error? What kind? Okay, time's up. Let's try this out. Some printing happened, and an exception got raised. The error object is not callable is due to the attempt to use the parentheses to invoke an object that can't be invoked. But why none type? Well, let's examine this from the inside out. Because the parentheses are here, it means inside is getting invoked right there. This is before it's passed as an argument. That's why this print happens first. Inside got called. What gets passed as the argument to outside is the return value from inside. In Python, all functions return something, even if you don't explicitly ask them to. In fact, if you don't use the return statement, what comes back is none. So here, none is what's being passed as the argument to outside. The first thing outside does is print this output, and then it tries to invoke this argument. But since the argument this time was actually the return value of inside instead of a reference to a function, and that return value was none, this line is attempting to call none, which isn't allowed. The result being the exception on the screen. All this has been a little abstract. Let's look at an example where this actually gets used. First, I need a list.
animals will do. The built-in sorted function returns a sorted copy of the original animals list. Consider the length of strings in the original list. This quick for loop shows the value and the length of each value in the animals list. You get the length of an animal string by calling the built-in len function. The important part of that sentence was function. Say you wanted to sort by the length of the string rather than alphabetically. The sorted function lets you do this. In fact, it supports the use of an arbitrary comparison mechanism by passing in a reference to a function that it then invokes and uses the result to compare as the basis for the order. Passing in len, sorts by the string length. This is kind of like the outside function above. You pass in len and sorted invokes it for each item in the iterable being sorted. It then uses the return value to determine the sort order. In this case, since len returns the length, the sort is based on the length, smallest value first. Sometimes you want a quick inline function like thing for one off usage. Python's version of these are called lambdas. I'll show you those next. Thank <laughs> you.